Welcome to the trading panel, the show where we assemble a group of traders or a panel of traders, I should say. We talk about all things markets and trading. As, as you can see on the screen, we've got a couple of the usual suspects. We've got a special guest and our first bird on the show. So I can't wait to hear the story around that. Jason, how's your week been? Good. How about you, Andrew? It's been pretty good. We're um, we're getting some colder weather now. So I was just saying to Pavel before, it's that transition from warm to cold. And so everybody's sniffling. So hopefully I don't sneeze and cough too much on the show today. <laughs> Do you get but, much uh, snow other than where that, you're at? All is good. Sorry? Do you get much snow where you're at? No, it doesn't get that cold. So oh, I'm being a little okay. dramatic, but uh, colder than... Uh, <laughs> You know, colder than what it has been the last few months. So, yeah, exactly. And Pavel, looks like he's got some warm weather. He's got a bit of a tan. I'm jealous. Well, well, it was, but the last two days it's freezing here, in fact. So it's snowing here again. So weekend was nice, and now it's under zero here in the Czech Republic again. So, yeah. Oh, my goodness. It was, was a little bit better, especially in Spain. But, yeah, we have to wait a bit. One more month. Yeah, exactly. And Jerry Parker, welcome to the trading panel. It's good well, to see you. Thanks for having here. me. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, thanks for now, coming, just... Jerry. Uh, I've, we've been trying to talk Sorry, to Jerry. Jesse. I've been trying to get Jerry week after week. I'm like so excited to get Jerry on here. There's no better person to have on this show than than Jerry to just kind of have a good conversation about trend following, systematic trading, and so on. So, you know, we're, we're all excited to have you and the bird. Uh, Petey is the name, right? That's right, PD a cockatiel. Um, not sure how old she is. She's a rescue, so she we got her in 2018, April of 2018. So, um, but yeah, she's is in here in my office every day. So we just kind of trade together. Uh, it's, well, I don't trade, so I just I watch the markets. <laughs> we watch the markets together. <laughs> no, no predictions together. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So um, how long, so you've been, I remember there was one time, there's kind of a funny one I was thinking of that, saying this to Andrew before we got on, but I remember there was one time, I think you mentioned uh, you hit, had the birds in the other room one time and you did an interview and people were wondering where the birds were. Was that, is that right? Well, uh, yes. And uh, so I would get really self-conscious about the birds flying around on Twitter spaces or a clubhouse and podcast. <laughs> And then, um, but then I got bolder and they're just usually always with me. And, and then once I didn't have them with me and people on the spaces got really nervous, like they wanted to hear the birds in the background and they come across the uh, microphones very loud, but they're hardly making a noise to me. I, they don't sound loud at all, but I, people tell me that they're very, very loud. So I apologize if they get too crazy. Uh, but there is th still one uh, podcast that I do. You know, I did it yesterday on uh, Schwab Schwab Network. I'm still too chicken to uh, bring the birds on. I don't know if they would invite me back. <laughs> they're, they're pretty. I think they're pretty serious. Versus um, most of the podcasts I'm on, it, it, we, we try to have a, a lot of fun and yeah, haven't done that yet. I mean, I love I love it. I think it's it's uh, it adds character. Um, I'm an animal lover too, though. You know, like I I always like to see people with animals in their background. I got four dogs and two cats and all types of stuff that pops up in the background for me. So it's just, I think it's awesome. I, you know, I've never actually heard anybody say anything, but Hey, that's super cool. Jerry has birds <laughs> in his videos. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I guess it depends on what I say too. Um, but if I said something pretty kooky. I think people would say, yeah, he's really losing it with having all these animals and birds around him. But my wife was out walking the dogs one day, 2018, and uh, she's an animal lover, and she's very knowledgeable about animals. And so this bird flew on her head, and she wasn't afraid, but she wasn't sure what kind of bird it was. So she was, like, doing a selfie to see, you know, what's on my head. Mm -hmm. And so she brought the bird inside, and I was like, oh, I don't like birds. Get this bird out of here. <laughs> and, uh, and like all good wives, she immediately ordered a cage <laughs> off of Amazon and uh so that's how we know exactly the day we got her and um then the bird and i just bonded after a week or two and it was just like best friends for life and that's that's the story of the bird so it can happen and uh people are very skeptical about how great little birds are and how much fun they are mm -hmm. 
but uh, I, as I was, but uh, one of these days, if you get a chance, you know, I recommend give it a shot. I have five dogs as well. The, the birds are much more manageable. Oh yes. Do, do they get along with the dog? Does the bird get along with the dogs? Well, we have labs and one of the labs is young and uh, she has a look in her eye that we try to keep <laughs> uh -oh. them apart. Yeah. But we actually have a picture of, uh, from a few years ago of Petey on the back of the older lab. And so we don't try, we didn't want to try that again, but it just happened one day we were watching, but I, w I don't recommend it. You know, uh, you never know what can happen. You see yeah. really do docile dogs do a lot of crazy things because they're hungry or something. No, I love it. Uh, I think it's cool. And I'm, I'm glad that you feel comfortable here to do that. Cause it's, to me, it's awesome. I think it just adds something to the show and every show you come on, I think it's, it's a lot of fun. So, yeah. you know, hopping right into it, Jerry, you know, can you give uh people, I know there's most people know who you are at this point, you know, we all know who you are, but can you give a little bit of a background on yourself? Well, I, um, worked for Richard Dennis in the turtle program in 19, I went to Chicago in 1983. And um, so I just uh, have been doing that trend following and really just in, a, in, a, in about the same way that we were taught you know, those many years ago, almost 40 years ago, over 40 years ago. And um, yeah, so I just bought the, the trend following idea hook, line and sinker. And I thought it was the greatest thing ever, but I thought it was great before I worked for Richard Dennis. I had read a bit about it and uh, read books and newsletters, and I was sort of um, interested in Marty Zweig and got his newsletter, and he was kind of a trend guy. So it was just a great situation for me to go to Chicago and learn how to trade from Richard Dennis and build that card. And it sort of was already something I already thought I knew something about, but I kind of really didn't compare to what they taught us, of course. And then that program lasted four years and I started Chesapeake in 1988. And, and we've just been trading uh, trend following strategy um, the whole time and nothing but the trend following strategy and sort of always more or less a preference to longer term trend following. And I was always uh, obsessed with uh, <clears throat> diversification and Rich uh, preached diversification that that was really the most, one of the most important things, your risk control, diversification, following rules, following systems, having a good back test, all that stuff. So, um, so now we're, I think we may be the only CTA that trades a full portfolio of currencies, commodities, and bonds and plus single stocks. So we trade 400 markets and about 200 of those are single stocks. And so that's my attempt to, um, not be so concerned about being part of managed futures or what is, you know, what is a managed future CTA supposed to do? I kind of wanted to be a trend follower first and uh, come up, put trend following the best light possible with all these markets, all these stocks, long and short, uh, single stocks, most CTAs, they trade the indexes. And so that was sort of my goal. And now we have an ETF that has that same program that's available to everyone um, in an ETF format with these 400 markets and 50% stock. So it's really kind of different and unusual. And, and another thing too, that's different from Ch about Chesapeake is we let profits run. We don't have a money management overlay, like 99.9% .9 of managed future CTAs that do some volatility management, correlation management. So an overlay on top of your system to reduce trades or increase trades when the volatility changes or the correlations change. So we just put the trade on at the entry and let it run without doing anything to it. So we're like, these days, we're very afraid uh, every day coming in and watching our cocoa position because we haven't scaled it back at all. We've just been uh, kind of crazy holding on to it. It's a winner. You're supposed to let profits run, uh, take small losses, cut losses short. So that's what we do. And that's enough. That's enough about my history because um, that's the highlights, I think. Uh, and probably a lot of people already know that about me because I say the same darn thing every time I'm on a podcast. I can't stop myself. <clears throat> but that's part of, I, I think also part of the reason why that's significant is because that's a significant part of your personality. Um, your personality and being a trend follower. Like trading isn't, trading isn't supposed to be exciting 
or fun like gambling. Like trading is supposed to be doing the same thing over and over again, having the discipline to do so. That's what makes you a good trader, uh, no, no matter what type of trader you are. So I think even like even if you say the same thing, the reason is because that's the discipline that you have to do this all these years. And that's something that people can always learn a lot from. Um, so just getting uh, just to name the ETF, you know, what is the name of the ETF? The symbol is um, TFPN and it's Blueprint Chesapeake Strategic Trend something. I, don't, I can never remember the name of it, believe it or not. It's so long, but it's Blueprint Chesapeake. I know the word trend is in there, uh, but it's TFPN and it's been going since about last July. So another thing to talk about too is you brought up Coco and mm. you, you and I have talked about this before. I'm, I'm one of the traders too, just like you. I don't vol target. I don't, but I'm sitting here every day just in fear of this Coco position because it's driving yeah. the whole portfolio. If Coco oh, yeah. has a down day, the portfolio does. You know, how yeah. did you, how do you handle that type of uh, pressure? Well, um, it's, it's really difficult. I mean, it's super difficult. I think I remember Rich saying, you know, profits are, can be destabilizing. You know, you can get a lot of, when you're losing money and you especially have a lot of trades, losing trades in a row, which trend followers can do. Uh, you have moderate profits that turn into losers, and you kind of like those small profits. You don't like them to turn into losers. You know, it really weighs on you, and it makes it difficult to have a good day. Or the worst thing, too, is it could if, impact your ability to carry out the trades and, and do all the trades you're supposed to do and do only those trades. But with something this big, gracious, it's, it can really just uh, d destabilize you. The bigger it gets, you know, the more money you make, the more nervous or worried you get, and you want to get out. And I think that's one of the biggest rules about trading, especially when you do a back test, is that the, the computer says like, you can hardly be too long term, you can hardly uh, hold on to those profits long enough, you're, you're human, you really are going to just try and everything in your bones to get out of that trade with any semi legitimate reason possible to take that profit. It's just how we're built. And so it's really difficult to uh, ask the computer, please optimize this for me to the trailing stop and the computer may say, oh, you got to be really long term. It's really difficult for people to accept that and do that. Now, I cheat a lot on that now because I trade 400 markets. So it's one out of 400 markets. Back in the total years, it was one out of 25. And then even uh, not long ago is maybe one out of 75 or 100. But one out of 400, it's so immaterial. And it just and it and that's kind of a bummer because I'm not having these eye popping returns that a lot of managed future CTAs are having that have cocoa as a as a material part of their portfolio. I subscribe to this idea that about five to ten percent of my trades are going to be outlier trades per year. They're going to be the ones that make all the money. So I've got forty of those I'm looking at uh, every year, and some people may have two or or four if they only trade. Uh, you know, a, a few, just a few markets. So, but that's the, it's, it's good and bad. I don't stress about cocoa at all because I'm happy for it, but it's just one out of 400. And I need a lot more. I need 39 other markets to really you know, make my year. And I need 39. And so I need a lot of bad things happening as well to get my ass handed to me. Um, but it used to be a, a, a much bigger deal than it is now. But now I have another psychological problem. I'm, I'm jealous of everyone making, uh, I'm jealous of Mulvaney making 50% in February and March, probably all due to Coco. No, I, I get that. And that's, it's well said. And, you know, for, and, and it's also part of when you're a money manager, you know, me being a PM, the amount of money I'm managing is nowhere near the amount of money that you're managing. So of course it's going to be different. I'm going to have less products I'm trading most of the time. And also when you're trading to that level that you're on, you're also your biggest goal is probably to protect your client's money every single day. And so it's like, you know, getting used to those two different worlds, uh, so to say. But I think it's it's cool to know and cool to also hear from you, because, you know, for me, it's it's been uh, very stressful because it really is running my portfolio. Yes, it's been cool returns, but also, you know, the down days are like, oh, it, it's just running it up and down every which direction. 
And I think it's hard, like you said, profits are de uh, destabilizing. You know, I think that's a really, really key point that you just said there. And I hope a lot of people picked up on that. It could be worse. And I've been in worse situations. And I'll tell you a situation that's way worse. And that is you don't have cocoa. Mm -hmm. And you thought about it. Uh, I've heard this recently from friends on Twitter. I thought about it. I used to trade it. But I took it out or I just skipped this trade. And cocoa, um, almost a lot of people confirm this with their back test that cocoa is um, a really bad market in the back test. And so I don't believe that that is worth uh, paying attention to. I think that you should uh, <clears throat> trade all the markets that are liquid and help with diversifying. Obviously, I don't go through my 400 markets and optimize them to make sure I've got the 400 best performing or 200 best performing stocks. I think there is uh, wisdom in trading all markets and not re really relying too much on history of a, any one particular market. And so my response to Coco never uh, really have never making money for maybe 15, 20 years was to trade two Cocos. We trade uh, London and New York. So, uh, and with the coffee as well. We trade three coffees. We trade uh, Brazil as well. And, uh, you know, wheat's another one that's not very good. And I think I trade six contracts of wheat. So you just never know. You can't predict these markets. You need to do a back test of hundreds and hundreds of markets and over many, many years and uh, take away from that your performance on an average, you know, how did the average market do um, and versus trying to look at the numbers as it relates to any one market. I think that's cool. Um, you know, the the idea of people taking stuff out of their portfolios, maybe we could pass that around the panel too, which is, I think that, you know, just like you said with Coco, I've, I've heard that so many times. I actually posted a chart showing all my cocoa trades over the last 10 years and how bad they were you know like there was a bunch of them they're just chopped chopped up over and over again until this final one and just kind of showing you know just sticking with your trading plan your strategy at some point you will get a good uh trend out of something that might look choppy for a long time so i'm wondering you know uh andrew cobble you know why what would make you take something out of a portfolio like something out of your algos, you know, you're done trading this specific ticker. Low liquidity, really untradeable conditions uh, other than uh, back tested, back, uh, like bad back test from the past. Definitely not something like that because I like what Jerry is talking about uh, that. You have to be broadly diversified across a big universe of basically assets or even in one asset, if someone is trading stocks or crypto algorithmically, for example, you never can pick just some universe. You always have to have some kind of ranking mechanism based on which you are trading, which is also, if I can, one of my questions to Jerry because he told us that he's trading half of his portfolio in stocks, basically single stocks. And what I would be interested in is what kind of mechanism, if I'm not going too much into secret sauce here, what kind of mechanism you are using for basically choosing these 200 stocks, if this is some kind of ranking based off I know, momentum or or what what is the mechanism because 200 stocks yeah it is a lot but uh, from the stock universe it's still very very small number of uh, tradable universe right so i think the way to look at the stocks is to look at is in the same way that you look at all the other markets so in the currencies we trade all the currencies um <clears throat> as long as they're liquid Mm. And in the commodities, the same way. We're trying to get our hands on more and more commodities. We trade them all, like all, almost all CTAs, at all possible. You trade whatever you can get your hands on. <clears throat> we even trade uh, sunflower seeds and white and yellow maize. <clears throat> and so we really push it, push the limit on uh, the volume and the liquidity in those markets. In the uh, same way with interest rates, we trade a lot of interest rates, a lot, uh, every bond future. You know, there was one bond future that I. I don't think too many people knew that it existed. We added it. It's the U.S. three-year. So I've only added it within the past six months or whatever. But uh, so we're always on the lookout. I read you know, newsletters of other 
CTAs of what they're trading, uh, especially on the currency front, because a lot of the currencies we trade, they're not, there are no futures. Uh, <clears throat> we trade a lot of the ETFs in, um, <clears throat> in fixed income that you don't get with the future tips, uh, junk, muni bonds, mortgage backs, um, corporate bonds. Those are not, there's no future. So we want to take this total mindset. They're all liquid. We can go long and short those. So we, we take the same mindset into the stock world where there's thousands and thousands of stocks. So how do you do it? Well, you certainly don't spend a lot of time thinking about it because we didn't spend any time thinking about the futures. The CME created it. We traded it. And it's that simple. So uh, I do see that people do get a certain level of anxiety when they think about these stocks, as do I. But basically, we just uh, choose um, the type of uh, stocks we want to trade that's going to give us a lot of um, diversification and sufficient liquidity. And I have chosen to trade small stocks, like um, mm -hmm. less than $10 billion. And so we just, uh, yeah, sort of like with this th theory that we want some commodity exposure. You can get quite a bit of commodity exposure through stocks. And we want small companies that have maybe one story. They're not very diversified. <clears throat> so they may be involved in real in uh, timber or um, oil or some some one product or one um, service that they do. So so um, I don't want them to be diversified and, and water down my outlier possibilities. So some piece of fundamental news or fact comes along and can hit this company and make their business really do well or whatever they produce do very well. Uh, that's what I'm looking for. So basically we then just trade the largest companies in that group. You know, we just say, okay, we're going to trade the 200 largest <clears throat> of um, anything below 10 billion. And then it's over with. We don't spend any time on it at all. And there's no need to because we have this fixed universe we're, we're going to hopefully trade these 200 stocks for the rest of our career. We're not going to be able mm -hmm. to because sometimes they go away, they get bought out or they go out of business. But uh, yeah, so I think it's the same mentality that you would have with futures, except you have to figure out a way to corral all these thousands into 100 or 200, ever how many you want to trade, and just do it based upon diversification, liquidity, and uh, just like I would do in the futures. There's really no difference. Um, you know, CTAs are, are not, it's kind of funny because you're always reading articles about how um, this stock is going to be great. I, I get a subscription to Barron's and it's always hitting me up with, you know, these are the stocks that are going to be moving next. And these are the stocks that have, have been doing really well. And I think I just want to ignore all that and just trade what is uh, liquid and diversifying. And then you may come up with another 200 that's different from my 200 and that's fine. You know, just be consistent for the rest of your career and try to trade those uh, 200 or 100 or whatever it is and um, just be consistent and have sort of a fixed universe. Uh, yeah, that's what, and just follow those trends as they randomly appear. Yeah, Jerry, yes. this... Um, oh, sorry, Pavel. Sorry no, no, no. I just wanted to thank thanks that for this sharing. Yeah. <clears throat> um, Jerry, you posted, I think it was yesterday, a, um, a comment on... Twitter or X about I'm just trying to remember the exact details. I was something about the the overperformance of um, you know funds that do short selling versus the I guess competitors that don't, and uh, it got me a little bit thinking about just then when you're talking about universe selection. When you select a stock or a future, do you go both long and short, or have the ability to go both long and short in all of the instruments you select, or are there some where you say oh, I'm only going to short this, I'm only going to go long or how do you look at that? Are you a little bit more selective there? I think you need to take that into consideration when you choose the stocks you're going to trade. You need to make sure that you can do the shorts and that uh, yeah. they're liquid and they're available to be borrowed and the, the borrowing fees are kind of normal. Uh, but I think it's critical to have uh, shorts in every market, of course. They don't really look very good on the back test, but um, you need them uh, as a diversifier in times where they will sort of do well when uh, longs do poorly you know um obviously an extreme example would be february march of 2020 uh, where everything was going down every we were long almost everything in every market 
and then they all started going down. So you're really you know, looking for those shorts to kick in quickly and for that uh, trend following trade to begin. So we, we just uh, you know, start selling those downside breakouts. <clears throat> and um, I'm not surprised that uh, research would show that uh, the portfolio performance would be better with shorts because, you know, once again, sometimes there's just no, nothing to own. There's no longs that are in an uptrend. So for us, it's, it's pretty important for us to have a good short position to, um, even though the longs historically have made all the money or almost all the money, uh, it, that could change. It could be like cocoa. The shorts could have a really great period, and and they also they all, even even uh, the, even though if they don't, they still add some uh, diversification and risk control. <clears throat> yeah, I think it's um it's quite I guess quite common for futures traders to go both long and short. But I think for people who trade stocks, th there are some um you know some limitations to being able to short. So, how do you think traders should uh, kind of look at look at that in their portfolio? I like to do in all the other markets, uh, unbiased. Yeah. You can easily be as you can be short just as easily as you can be long. But once again, I think in stocks you yeah. need to. Uh, it's a little bit more difficult because you need to stick with some stocks that have enough liquidity, so you can short them, and there's uh, borrowing fees as well. So you want those to be sort of um, reasonable and uh, it's not hard but it, there is no reason to avoid doing shorts just like there's no reason to avoid doing shorts in um bond bond futures currency futures and commodity futures do, do you ever find that the shorting pool in stocks dries up just when you need it the most have you ever had situations like that <laughs> no because i go in knowing that that's very very unlikely to occur you know I've got right. my my uh, portfolio of stocks that um, I'm not. I haven't had to worry about that. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. To me, um, to me, it's very interesting because I have to say that uh, I like trend following a lot. I'm trading like broad portfolios of different strategies on stocks or on crypto and so on. But even though I'm trying to be as unbiased as I can. I still cannot trade long term short trend following on stocks because I can see that over the last 50 years of data, these kind of strategies were basically losing money. I understand it completely in, in your situation as a strong diversifier, but I'm just saying that to me, it's something like against logic uh, to trade to trade it. But I completely understand your solution, of course. Well, if um, <clears throat> if you um, so if if what you're trying to say is that uh, shorting the stock market is not profitable, then I agree. But any individual stock can be very profitable. I mean, you know, the, people write these other studies that show that um, <clears throat> four percent of all the stocks made all the money, you know, in, the, in a buy and hold. So. If you owned all the stocks for the past 100 years, only 4% of those stocks really made any money for you. So owning stocks doesn't really make money. 96% of them don't really make any money. Um, but that's not what we're doing. We're in there for this slice of the trend. You know, one of the greatest yeah. trades of all time would be Enron. You know, the tr it was a huge, massive uptrend and it was a huge, massive downtrend. But Enron itself made no money. It, it, um, it went bankrupt. A trend follower made money on this big uptrend and made money on the big downtrend. So we're not really caring too much about um, about what happens in the stock market per se. It's what happens on, you know, with these stocks. Do they have trends, uptrends, downtrends? And we're gonna we want to be on those trends. So they're just and they don't really uh, stocks short stocks. I have never seen a back test that showed they made money in, overall. But there's a lot of markets that don't make commodities that probably don't make in general. When you look at all the commodity shorts, they mm. probably didn't make money either. Um, but we still trade them and they do help out from a risk control point of view. And they do help when the, when the longs are, are suffering. Let's say the long trades or there, there are no longs uh, to be had. And, um, you know, they can help. Yeah, that's all. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Yeah, Jerry, there's a, um, a comment in the chat here um, about we can model trends and seasonality, but noise, um, I'm not sure what the rest of that comment um, means. But uh, do you ever look at the noise in the markets or um, or maybe in individual stocks and use that as a consideration in your models? Well, I don't look at any um, market by itself. You know, I really don't care what these markets have done historically or or currently um, the noise or, or the trends uh, in these markets. I just look at, um, you know, the system and how it performs over all the markets, over all the test period. I don't really pay any attention to recent performance. So, but I am very worried about... Um, you know, getting into trades too quickly. So we try not to get in so quickly. You know, we want to make the market show a lot of trend and stay away from uh, maybe that's noise, you know, of the gyrations back and forth, uh, the markets hitting the breakouts on the upside, then going down to the downside. So we try to have longer term parameters to where we're just not getting in the trades. Uh, it's really difficult for us to get in. We have to get into a trade. It has to show a lot of uh, trend and momentum. And then once we get in the trade, you know, we have this, um, two things we have to be concerned about. One is uh, we don't want to get shaken out too quickly. So we have to have a long-term exit. And then that's going to keep, because there is a lot of noise. Like you look at Coco or some of these big trends, there is some really bad spikes down um, in these markets. And you have to uh, look at your back test and see the what, what is required. And it's unfortunately, it's usually what's required is to have a trailing stop that's pretty far away or what we would call loose pants. You know, you can't be too tight. And so the problem with the loose pants and having a trailing stop that's, you know, the 100 day low or the or the 200 day moving average or 300 day moving average is that you give back a lot of profit, but or you can give back a lot of profit. But that's sort of what the back test says. Look, if you want to make this money, you got to be tough. You've got to hang in there. You got to accept a certain amount of volatility and a certain amount of of um, ups and downs. And then uh, in something like uh, Coco, when you know that you've really nailed one, it's really a nice trade. It's going to be a great trade. You have to have a, your trailing stop needs to be uh, close enough to where it's, you don't get back all of your profit or too much of your profit. Uh, I think on any one individual trade, you will have that happen. And so that's why you don't want to look too closely at, at any one trade. But you want to look at all the trades and how did this these systems perform um, over all the markets, over all the data, um, and that's what we're going to go with. And there's nothing more important than the current trade in everyone's mind. Clients are very concerned about it. They're concerned about performance that we're having now. We're concerned about it. We're very uptight about it. We want to book these performance fees, and and we want to um, have a good track record. But really, you got to force yourself to try to not to be so concerned about these particular trades and how they're going to play out. It's all random. You just want to commit to yourself that you're going to follow your rules. And I don't think you're going to have better performance than following your rules. I think discretionary moves based on fear or greed are probably just going to mean you're going to make less money. So you're walking that fine line. Don't get out too quickly, but don't stay too long. And I think that really is, you know, more, more, more than anything else, psychologically difficult. Yeah, I guess yeah, that's they... the. Um... Oh, sorry, Jason. No, go ahead, Andy. <laughs> Did you want to? I was going to say, I guess that's that's part of the art of trading, right? And it takes, well, I think it takes a long time, a lot of trading, before you you kind of understand the the delicate balance that can be there sometimes. How do you think traders who are just starting out can accelerate that process of um, understanding what you're just talking about then? Uh, well, <laughs> I don't think, yeah, I think it's just looking at the back test really and um, running different parameter sets and seeing how long-term you need to be and seeing how, how short-term you can be. You must be a certain, uh, you know, <clears throat> you can't be too short-term, you can't be too long-term and just finding the sweet spot. And it's a pretty big spot. Um, but then just committing yourself to do it. So I think the knowledge of gaining that knowledge is pretty easy. I don't think you need to have any experience or any uh, 
intuition, you just need to be committed to do the back test and then committed to follow it. And I think that's the problem. And I think what happens also, and it definitely happened to me before, not recently, but it has happened to me. And that is you get this performance and you see with uh, these, the strategy that, uh, yeah, this thing makes a lot of money. It does really well. And uh, yes, historically, it's had some bad periods. Um, just mainly really big profits turning into smaller profits. You know, this really bums us out. We don't, some people even go so far as to declare that a, a loss. Like I think if I take a loss and I get out of a trade with a small loss, that's the loss. I don't really consider give back of a massive profit like Coco as I couldn't really honestly characterize that using the word loss. It's just a give back of profit. I understand it's painful, um, but really I think understanding the rules and the, the systems based on breakouts and moving averages that get you in the trades and that are the optimal strategies, optimal parameters, I think it's really easy. It's not hard at all. Everyone, anyone can do it. Hire someone to do it for you, to write the back test. Now, you look in real time, you start trading this thing. You're like, oh my gracious, we have to add some more things to it because I don't like what's occurring. So wait a second, when I told you about this system, you wanted to trade it, I ask you, is making the most amount of money that you possibly can, is that good enough? And you said yes, but in reality, it's not good enough. Oh no, because we have to add other things to it, other parameters, uh, more rules that makes it um, less reliable, less robust, because we cannot stand to watch this violent fluctuations with our profit like we have in Cocos. It's totally just a psychological thing. And um, people have these rules, they pat themselves on the back and they say, I'm following the rules. True, but you have a lot of bad rules and you have too many rules and you have over-optimized rules. And this is what I think um, is the problem, is not finding it, not having it, not having the experience. I mean, come on, technically, if you have a systematic approach and you're good with the computer and you've come up with a good system and good rules and you trade a lot of markets, uh, you don't over-optimize, you're ready, you're set. What do you need to do? Just do the trades. You don't need any, uh, you know, I mean, uh, I think experience is good, don't get me wrong, but um, I had lots of experience many times. I've had lots of experience over the years and I just, was weak and decided to uh, do a non-system trade, for instance, and it never worked out. And I think that's what you need to do is get into a situation where you can train yourself or learn how not to override your system. Yeah, I think there's um, uh, there's also a gap there in the back testing process because a lot of these reports that get spit out by these trading platforms, they're all based on, <clears throat> or the stats are based on closed trades. And yeah, sure, there are some stats that show you what's happening in, in inside a trade, but you don't really get a good understanding of that until you actually trade the thing. And you go like, uh, like Jason said today, you know, this Coco trades, you know, throwing around my portfolio with this open trade because it's so so much profit, and you you don't really get that understanding by looking at a back test. And um, so, is there like? Um, is there a different way that you should look at back, back tests to get that understanding or how do you recommend people approach that? Well, I think you definitely need to have a back test. It shows, um, you know, the daily fluctuations of your open positions for sure. <clears throat> but um, probably it would, would is the case for most traders and certainly was for me over the years has been, I was just trading too large. And sometimes when you trade so large and you have so much fluctuation and the losses are approaching 30, 40%, the drawdowns, let's say, are approaching that, you know, it's almost impossible to, to keep trading that system and, and maintain discipline. So I know that was one of Rich's um, most important rules. Uh, two, two, the two most important rules were follow your system and trade small. Uh, trading small is, is, a, is a superpower. I mean, we all overestimate how much risk and volatility we can handle, except Mulvaney. He's he's uh, he's really good at that. But um, I think for most of us, you know, you want to get to a situation where you can really sleep well at night, and and you know, your volatility and your risk allows you to actually do this, do the systems, do the trades. I think one thing to add that you know you said. <clears throat> 
earlier, which, you know, when we're, when we're talking about returns, you know, like so many people get stuck on good trades over what my yearly return is, you know? And I, I think for me, like, well, yes, the cocoa trade is uh, flopping around and doing all types of stuff to the portfolio at the moment. That doesn't mean I, I care that much. I know that that's part of my strategy. That's what I do. So the volatility inside of that one trade is just one of many trades. And I think if you continue to just kind of, fo I think that's the things that new traders don't focus on enough. Um, new traders don't really focus on that. Hey, over a one year period of time, I'm going to have great returns. Yes. Um, Coco, which is netting, you know, I think around 150% year to date right now, will probably, if it stops me out here, I'll probably get out with like 130%. Um, and that, be, that has to be totally fine with you because you understand your back test and your strategy. And that's just part of it. And that little bit of a give back is just a small thing and part of your process. So I think too many new traders really get stuck on this um, idea of every trade has to be a good trade. Every trade has to be right. Um, whereas a, a seasoned trader basically doesn't, you know, I don't, I don't care what goes up in the portfolio. I know that I'm going to lose on more than half of my trades. Um, they're going to be small losers. And then I'm going to have a few outliers and a bunch of break evens and a bunch of small profits. And that's how my years are going to go. Um, and that's how I produce my own returns. Because at the end of the day, too many people are just getting stuck on. They, they look at the market like it's this thing that should be paying them. Like, hey, I'm a trader. I should be getting my weekly salary or something. It's like, no, like. You're going to have periods of time where you have trades like Coco and so on in a great quarter and you go, hey, that was awesome. And then you're going to have periods of time where the market isn't conducive to your strategy and you're flat and in a drawdown. Um, that's going to happen, too. So it's really like taking that long term focus. I mean, if you're doing this for the, the right reasons, you're doing it for, a, a, you know, to make more money. Not, you're not gambling. You're trying to make money over time. You're trying to compound your wealth. And so the more you're able to compound your wealth over those years, the better you are. But that short term view of, hey, you know, this volatility, uh, you know, I, I need to get every trade right. Um, it's just a bad way of looking at, at trading. Yeah. To me, to me, it is also about truly deeply understand the solution or the approach I'm trading, because one thing is backtest, backtested results, what they are showing us. But uh, the other thing is what really trend flowing is about. Yeah, you will have huge open profits and you will get give back a lot of open profits. If you want to trade minor versions, you will have maybe more stable uh, profits over the time with big dips in the equity curve from time to time. So I think that this is the biggest reason why novice traders that already can backtest properly that uh, knows what backtesting is showing them, how even backtest uh, that the way that the results won't be over-optimized, but they cannot stick with the, the trading solution. I think that the biggest bridge here is that they really truly don't understand what the trading approach that they are trading is all about. I, I think this is big, big mistake or just, just not experience enough in this kind of terms. And, I think researches uh, can help a lot here, like uh, being getting this knowledge. So, Andrew, you want to uh, bring up some of these questions? We got some interesting ones for for Jerry. Um, yeah, I was just looking through that actually. So, we've talked about the one for noise, which is more of a comment. Um, oh, here's one I don't think we covered. I thought I heard Jerry once say he only shorts ETFs. That's no, I don't trade any. Um, <laughs> I don't know if Jerry trades. Stock, I don't trade stock ETFs. I trade like corporate bond ETF, <clears throat> mini bond ETF, tips ETF, um, mortgage back ETF, but no, no stocks. And it's, uh, Strictly, um, I mean, only stocks on the single stocks on the longs and the shorts. Yeah, okay. Actually, there's not a lot of questions here. We've got one from Marcus. Jerry's the best. 
TFPN to the moon. <laughs> Thanks, Marcus. <laughs> Now, um, Jason, I cut you off before. You were going to ask a question. I don't know. Do you want to go back and revisit that? Or do no, that was exa exactly what I was mm -hmm. I was trying to say because I think it's, um, mm -hmm. you know, that Jerry was talking about the the idea of yearly returns and, and or being patient and understanding your systems. And I was just thinking about newer traders and what they kind of do wrong. So I just was trying to uh, talk about that a little bit. But I think that, you know, us having these conversations, um, you know, on here and constantly being very public about like how disciplined we are as traders. Like, I think that helps people a lot. Um, so it's, it's great to have someone like Jerry on here just to kind of really focus people on those things uh, and getting into the individual stocks, Jerry, you mentioned earlier about the commodity based stocks and getting some um, commodity exposure through individual stocks. Now, how do you do you weight that a specific way um, for your fund? Uh, no, I don't. Um, like I said, I just have a systematic way of choosing which stocks to put in there based upon their liquidity. And uh, anything less than 10 billion is uh, something I might trade. But then once I get the list of stocks below 10 billion, I'm going to choose those based upon um, liquidity and diversification. So I might uh, make sure I don't, I'm not overloaded in uh, too many uh, gold stocks or gold miners or <clears throat> uh, mining companies in general. But uh, there's a lot of, uh, you can get quite a bit of commodity exposure with companies. It's a different type of commodity exposure. You know, so we have, uh, we trade lumber futures and we trade lumber producers. And uh, so, Sometimes and we trade um, shipping companies and shipping futures. So sometimes the uh, futures does better, and sometimes the the, the stock does better. Yeah. Uh, but it's so it's another way to, just to diversify. And of course, things like um, lithium and um, uranium, marijuana, uh, you know, can't get those with futures. We have a company that's the biggest egg producer. In the country, we, we have that one as well. So it doesn't take a lot to, to find. Um, I'm just looking at the list now. Coal, steel, asphalt, uh, lumber, uh, uranium. Uh, a lot of mining companies, we uh, supplement our aluminum and copper and um, nickel, lead, and tin and zinc trading with uh, the miners. Um, we have one company that owns a, I guess, millions of acres of trees. Uh, so there's all sorts of um, different companies um, that you can get that kind of uh, have some, you know, have a, a um, <clears throat> commodity connection. You know, I wanted to uh, get a company that um, was involved in um, perfume, you know? I wanted a perfume company. There's a couple of companies out there that uh, make perfume. So I'm like, well, perfume, yeah, it's a commodity, right? It's something, right? So I bought this company, it was like two or three I had, and so I bought the breakout in ELF, E-L-F. And Elf just went to the moon, and it was just incredible. It's still going. It's like it looks like Nvidia, you know. So I, I even posted that one day. Like here's in, here's Elf, and here's Nvidia. You can't tell the difference. And uh, and so, but then I realized that um, Elf really didn't make perfume. It was a retailer, and I was like, darn, I, I got that wrong. And I still couldn't I still couldn't stop from making money because. So I think sometimes when you have these ideas about like that idea, like. Uh, I, I want a producer and not a retail that you it's sort of a little bit of predicting there. And it's kind of like, uh, it doesn't matter what you think, Jerry, that company can still have a big trend and, and it did. So um, I've done that a couple of times where I thought I was buying something that um, was a producer, but it was actually a seller. And uh, it, it ended up really good for me. Uh, so you don't really ever know. You can't predict these markets and, and even um, having that mentality of, small companies with one story and one product they, you can the big the best uh stock trade i've seen in a long time is eli Lilly. i think it's better than nvidia 
It's one of the biggest companies on the planet. And so my whole idea, I tell people, look, I have this idea, but don't follow me because there's lots of examples of uh, things that don't fit my my thinking that if you just trend followed them, you'd, you're going to do very, very well. No one can predict these markets. It's really just a way that, for me to be very consistent and very disciplined uh, approach to stocks. It doesn't mean it's always going to work work out the best. No, I like that. It's an interesting conversation just because, you know, for me, I, I, I haven't, I trade the sector futures, but I haven't gotten into, into the individual stocks at all. Um, and something I've been looking at more as time has gone on. So it's just a fun conversation to have and just to learn more because you're one of the, I think you were one of the first ones to start really doing that and talking about it. So it's really interesting because I, it's the same thing. I see every time somebody shows me an individual stock, I see the trends, I see the breakouts. I mean, there's tons of them out there. So you're, I absolutely agree with you. That's right. It's particularly, you know, um, interesting now that just sticking with a normal CTA portfolio of 50 or 60 markets would have done better because of Coco, basically. Uh, I saw this one tweet out there recently that said, careers are being made in Coco. You know, you really don't want to make a career in one market, you know? <laughs> if, you, if you're making a career in one market in Coco right now, which you're making all this money, as soon as you get out of the Coco, just swear you'll never do that again and start trading hundreds and hundreds of markets because you really lucked out because I have traded 20 markets or 50 markets and it is brutal because you can really just get crushed when, uh, when that one market has a reversal or, you know, um, a few markets just have some whipsaws and all of a sudden you're down 10 or 15% uh, because, you know, your portfolio is just not large enough to withstand some uh, really unluck. It's really unlucky. I think trading hundreds of market eliminates, well, does eliminate, it minim minimizes bad luck of, you know, you, because if you're only relying upon 10% of your of your markets to make all your money every year and 10% uh, of the trades to be outliers, <clears throat> well, you can have some really bad luck. Um, and uh, if you miss a couple because you only trade 20 markets, you have two years where you don't get any, yeah, you're gonna get four or five or six in year three, but you've had two really bad years. So I think that's what it's, it's good for. And then if you're gonna trade like we do a real strict, um, classic trend approach with it doesn't reduce positions. It's not going to reduce the cocoa position. Let's just cut cut to the to reality here. If you're not going to reduce cocoa, dude, you're not willing to reduce anything, right? This is out of control trade. And if you're going to trade like that and uh, abide by this cliche of letting profits run and taking small losses, then I do it because I think it's the safest and mo most robust way to trade. But I can cheat a little bit by trading all these markets because I'm relying upon the markets to give me some uh, smoothness, as much smoothness in my returns as possible, not more parameters and more rules. Hmm. I so think it's people here. Go ahead. Sorry, Andy. you go, Jason. You uh, go. I think it's interesting about the Coco thing because you'll talk to certain CTAs, and I think what's one way you can tell they're way too concentrated is when they're talking about 50, 60 percent returns in the quarter. Like, you know, that that tells you that they either they're way too concentrated. They have no idea exactly what they're doing or, you know, they're just every all in on cocoa. And it's like, you know, basically, if you had 10 percent, 20 percent, that makes some sense. But when you get to that 50 percent, you know, and, and I had I had one guy tell me he had a 78 percent return in Q1. It's like. You're you're you might be trading a little bit too big there. <laughs> well, in 1986, um, we there was a lot of good trends going on. I know one of them was short crude. Crude uh, went to ten dollars, and we probably had a big position on. Um, and I know that I went home one day and I was up a hundred and I was up two hundred percent, and this was in the first half of the year. I was up 200%. My bonus was a million dollars. And I was so excited. Uh, and then on Monday, I, we came in and we lost 60% in one day. Ooh. And uh, that's just a lot of leverage. And, um, you know, some amazingly great trends. And it wasn't like a tremendously bad day. But we made 200% uh, because it wasn't tremendously amazing trends. There were good trends. So leverage... Um, you know, hit all of that, all of that risk. And, uh, 
So I think that uh, you know, chugging along, making 15 or 20% a year, trying to trade a lot of markets, um, I just have no interest in being the typical CTA, this typical managed futures, only trading futures and trading stock indexes. I want to see what trend following can really do and real and classic trend following, you know, the traditional, let those profits run. Can, can it work? And I think the best way for it to work is trading many, many different markets. And uh, the stocks that I trade, they they don't look like the S and P. Uh, they all go down sometimes and they all go up sometimes, but um, they, you can get quite a bit of diversification trading smaller, mid, mid medium sized companies. Yep. All right. Well, that was a, a great way to end the show because we're just about out of time here. I think, Jerry, my favorite quote from you today was trading small is a superpower. I think that's a great, great quote that a lot of mm -hmm. traders um, figure out the hard way. <laughs> so, yeah. Thanks for sharing that. So, uh, Jerry, where can people find more from you? Uh, they can find more from me at chesapeakecapital.com and tfpnetf.com. And on Twitter, RJ Parker Jr. 09. <clears throat> yep. Excellent. Thank you. And Jason, you can go next. Oh, you're on mute. You yeah. So, it? Okay. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, uh, you know, thanks for coming on, Jerry. This is a lot of fun, yeah. as always. I, I always really get a lot ch chatting with you. Thanks for taking the time with all of us. And uh, you guys can find me. Uh, uh, again, against all odds research, aaoresearch.com, AAO research at Substack, um, and also JasonP138 on Twitter. Excellent. And Pavel? Okay, follow me on Twitter uh, and check our website, robaxio.com, and that's it. Okay. And for me, uh, bettersystemtrader.com on Twitter, YouTube, everywhere else as well. So, um, thanks for joining us today, Jerry. Uh, do you want? Do you have any closing words before we finish up uh, for today? Oh no, I don't. No? Um, thank you for having me. It was a, it was really fun, and uh, I want to come back and not do as much talking, but I want to ask some questions <laughs> myself to you guys next time. Hopefully, thanks for having me. It's been uh, fun. Thanks for coming, Jerry. This was a blast. Yeah. Yeah. Great. And thanks, everyone, for joining us. Great comments in the chat today. We'll see you next week, 4 p.m. Eastern, Wednesday. I got it. Yes. <laughs> Catch you then. Bye. <laughs>